today I might offend a few people, which as we know today is a very dangerous thing to do, because I'm not going to flatter my audience. I mean, there are a few things to be said that are a bit uh, hard to handle. So if you want to hear uh, Westerners praise India, I suggest you go to, to David Frawley or so, to Maria Wirt and so on. But uh, I am, I'm here for the unpleasant things. And so uh, I'm going to address an issue that really is a, a sort of a cause for concern. Well, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only Westerner who does this. Lately, I've noticed that writings by Francois Gaultier also have this uh, a lot of attention for the weak points of the Hindu position and for the weak points of the present government that Hindus had uh, expected so much from. So well, anyway, this is what I'm going to address, and it starts with the. Um, observation that India is in the middle of a war, a war inflicted by its enemies, and that uh, all the observers who like to paint some belligerent, aggressive picture of the Hindu movement systematically fail to report what then are the reasons for that. Or, or they do paint it, but falsely. They give false reasons for it. So, like for example, a, a little small example, lately there was the case of a Dalit Hindu who had married a Muslim woman, and then he was murdered by her family. So I've actually seen a report where it was claimed <laughs> that the anger that resulted among Hindus was not because of the man's murder, but was because he had the effrontery of leaving the Hindu fold by marrying a Muslim, though in fact he had precisely not left the Hindu fold, because he was a Dalit and the upper caste Hindus resented him uh, taking his distance from the Hindu fold, which is the very opposite of what he had done. So that way, you know, you, you very systematically get a wrong uh, perception of uh, what it is that Hindus are so worried about. I suggest uh, about a hundred years after the fact now that they uh, read the book by Swami Shadhananda, Savior of the Dying Race which is about Hindu Sangathan, Hindu self-organization, where he explains the reasons, where he says that, you see, Hindu, Hinduism is on course to disappearance if we don't uh, turn the tide now. That's what he said 100 years ago. It's perhaps interesting to evaluate what has happened since. Because after all, Hindu society was a lot stronger then than it is now. Um, and then already he thought there was uh, all the need to do something about it, which for him was two things, Sangatham, self-organization, and Shudhi. And Shudhi meant for the Arya Samajis that he was, reconversion, of converted Hindus who are now Muslims or Christians back to Christianity. At that time, that was a big movement. I wouldn't say it is a big movement today, though there are efforts nowadays called Dharva uh, homecoming. But the main difference is simply the, um, the reach of uh, Hinduism in India, of course, there's already Pakistan and Bangladesh Gopto, but especially in society. You see, back then, Hinduism was something obvious, something that children breathed, and they became Hindu practically without knowing. You see, today, these uh, circumstantial influences determine your uh, cultural identity, 
have become a lot less Hindu, uh, are of course more uh, more uh, more foreign elements and so on. That perhaps is inevitable, but especially all these anti-Hindu elements that they are now breathing in through the modern media and through education. Okay, so I mean, this this is a, an important topic that I just sketch uh, for a moment comparison between a hundred years ago and today. But a hundred years ago, at any rate, the practical conclusion was to self-organize the Hindus, and that is why back then, 1922, the Hindu Mahasabha was formed, and in 1925, the RSS. So back then, there um, seemed to be a, uh, a hope that Hindus were ready for the siege that they were finding themselves in. At any rate, they find themselves in a siege because there is uh, no attempt at all on the side of Christians and Muslims to hide that they are willing to gobble up the entire Hindu society. They'll have to fight between the two of them what ultimately happens, but that Hindu society has to disappear, that they are uh, absolutely sure. And the secularists have less of a clear perspective of where they want to be going. Christians and Muslims know at least what message they are offering. But they too think that uh, Hinduism isn't here to stay, except for a bit of museum Hinduism the type that you find in uh, Shashi Tharoor's Hinduism. But Hinduism is on the way out. And indeed, the, uh, the figures by Pew Research show that Hinduism is the religion most susceptible to conversions out of it. There are a few Westerners and a few, you know, Bollywood celebrities and so on once in a while who revert to Hinduism or convert to Hinduism, but uh, the general trend is rather negative. So Hinduism finds itself at war. That is how it is depicted a lot by foreigners, but in a bit of an altered sense, they think that Hinduism is the great aggressor the overbearing majority that wants to oppress and oppress and oppress the minorities. Well, what do you do then? The object of the war is survival. Maybe it is best, first of all, to impress that upon yourself. This is not a war for the enjoyment of power. Uh, this is a war for survival. The, um, question that I ask myself when I see the conduct of Hindus in this situation is whether they desire victory or not. You see, if, um, if you desire victory, you can still fail, of course, but at least that's a prerequisite for succeeding, or, or so I thought. Maybe it's not a prerequisite for succeeding, Namely, if you promote other factors that somehow, in a circuitous way, promote victory. And maybe that is what Hindus are doing. I mean, after all, all these other civilizations have disappeared. Hinduism is still there. It's weakened, but still, it's still impressive. So you might say, well, Somehow they have found a way to survive. Uh, perhaps, you see, religious Hindus are going to enthusiastically say yes, because all these yajnas and pujas that they do somehow uh, create good vibrations. And somehow, somewhere, these might have a positive effect on the power equation and thereby might help dharma to survive. But I wouldn't count on it. You see, maybe in a subtle way, this is how it works. 
but I uh, wouldn't uh, count on that. I mean, as they say, trust in God, but tie your camel first. The um, first area where I, in my field of work, have noticed that there's something wrong is the Aryan invasion theory and that debate. This debate has been going on for a quarter century and Hindus haven't gotten very far, you see. Of course, strictly speaking, it's not an ideological debate, it's a scientific debate, but the Hindu nationalists have invested a lot in it. And from them, you might have expected, since they think it's important to win this debate, that they'd have invested a lot in it. And that turns out not to be the case. They haven't set up any serious think tank or something, uh, let alone an institute, uh, an educational institute, for studying this whole question, for apprising you know, themselves of what the position of the other side is. That's, I mean, absolutely essential in any confrontation that you find out what the other side thinks. I mean, that's that's so totally essential. I don't need to quote Sun Tzu, the Chinese strategist about it. This is just totally obvious. And yet, I never see him do that. Not even those who are more or less professionally involved. They don't care to see how the other side is thinking, let alone, you see, what arguments they have up their sleeve. They are satisfied with belittling the enemy and saying, oh, he's uh, either uh, anachronistic, so living in the 19th century, uh, or they have a moral argument that, oh, he's racist, uh, he's colonialist, uh, and they feel very good at that. You see, they, uh, they have a moral high ground. Okay, you are racist, you are colonialist, and we are not. And that makes us morally superior to you. Well, uh, that is not a very important argument for scientists. Somebody may have the wrong motives and still be right. Mm -hmm. And secondly, in this case, the, those motives aren't really there anymore for two reasons. The community of uh, scholars was not representative for society as a whole at that time, and was much less guided by colonial or racist motives. Secondly, whatever they may have done in the 19th century, today there has been something that Perhaps, I'm afraid to say, many Hindus fail to notice there has been change. You see, first of all, there is the big rupture of 1945 when um, racism totally went out of fashion, certainly as a scientific model. And since then, there has been an enormous, uh, you, could, might, you might call it positively uh, change in consciousness negative people will call it brainwashing, but at any rate, there has been this enormous wave of anti-racism, which is now something of a, a state religion in the West. And so whatever they secretly think, nobody's going to publicly espouse racism, not if he values his academic career, his status in society and so on. So your enemy camp has moved on and you see Hindus don't feel the need to uh, to adapt to the new situation. They are satisfied that you see they have this moral high ground and they want to keep it that way. Well I, I'm afraid you can't afford that you see if you want to win, you have to be supremely realistic. You know, you, you can't sit on a battlefield powdering your nose for the victory parade while the fighting is still going on.
that's more or less what uh, what Hindus are doing there. This is in that particular field, the Aryanization debate. Now, something similar can be said uh, in the political field. Uh, here, I want to make a little uh, distinction between two groups of people. One is the leaders and one is everyone else. Now, personally, being democratically minded, I don't think that distinction should be there. I think everybody can participate in the political process. Sometimes I get uh, I get feedback. Uh, oh, Dr. Els, don't worry so much about the truth. Truth is only for intellectuals like you. You know, we can tell stories just to to whip up the masses and so on. Well, that's that's very uh, worrying, you know. And I mean, I know this is not only in India that this happens, but perhaps Hindus are more um, more open about it. That you see, for for the ordinary people, it doesn't matter what you tell them. No, you see, I think the ordinary people are as much entitled to the truth as as the leadership is. I also don't believe in censorship. Censorship determines what the common people are allowed to hear. Uh, no, in, in this case, there really should be one. Nevertheless, I also accept that it's a fact of life that you have a leadership class and the rest. Uh, they're not castes specifically. Somebody can climb up from below to the top. But at any rate, there is a functional difference between the top and the rest. So in a way, it's the top I have to address because it's they who make the difference. And this you can see very well in uh, the functioning of the uh, current leadership. The uh, Bharatiya Zanata Party has been in power at this time of speaking for eight years which is a sufficiently long time to make the difference. And it turns out that this leadership is uh, not really doing what it had promised or at least what it had been expected to do. Now here I have to make a little parenthesis. What was it expected to do? You see, most people who talk about the BJP actually talk about the John Sang. And in fact, the John Sang in its beginning years. The John Sang is the earlier incarnation of the BJP. It existed from 1951 to 1977. It was the Hindu Nationalist Party. It was set up by the RSS as one of its many front organizations. It had a, a trade union, a student organization, and so on and so on. And so it also had a political party. This was already a bit of a watered down version from what the Hindu Mahasabha had been, but that party became non-viable after one of its members had committed the Mahatma murder. So what Hindus were stuck with was the John Sang, which under the initial leadership of Shyam Prasad, uh, Shyam Prasad Mukherjee was no doubt a real Hindu party with a, a pro-Hindu program, a pro-Hindu performance, except that that didn't make any practical difference because they had no power. But at least they said the right things. That gradually uh, declined already uh, during those, uh, how many is it, 26 years. For example, in um, the mid-1960s, you had the introduction of this uh, ideology called integral humanism. Now, there is nothing wrong with integral humanism. Indeed, it's, uh, it's so good that the uh, other side systematically obscures the existence of 
uh, integral humanism. Integral humanism is now the official doctrine of the party, and yet they systematically say, oh, it's in nationalism, it's fascism, or some ugly term. You see, a nice, innocent term like uh, integral humanism, they will absolutely avoid. They don't, don't want to give you the idea that there is anything nice or even just innocent about uh, the party. Anyway, so that was adopted in the mid-1960s. And while I'm willing to say quite a lot of good about it, I also noticed that it doesn't contain the word Hindu. Now, that doesn't have to be so. In fact, the word Hindu is a relatively recent term. And ancient uh, Hindu uh, states did not deal in the word Hindu. You see, everybody in India was Hindu in some form. You see, there were different sampradayas who had their own quarrels. But still, this, this distinction with, uh, with Christian or Muslim or, or secularist didn't exist. And so they just uh, focused on the issues at hand. They didn't care for labeling them Hindu. So maybe that's how you should understand the term integral humanism. I mean, what is Dharma but an integral humanism? Maybe integral humanism is nothing but a modern expression of the same idea as Sanatana Dharma. True, but I also notice that the word Hindu is not there and that this is part of a general evolution. You see, at that time already, the John Sang was uh, more and more led by people like uh, like Atal Bihari Vajpayee, like Nanaji Deshmukh, who spoke as their goal in politics of development. I remember interviewing Nanaji Deshmukh, and he was always talking about development. At that time, I didn't understand. This is what I mean. Who is against development? Isn't that obvious? Indira Gandhi, though she doesn't do these things, she at least speaks of development. She promises people development. And all the Western you know, NGOs and governments and so on, what they expect India to do is development. So anyway, so that, that's what he was talking about. So at the time, I didn't sufficiently realize that what he was really doing was filling the space with something else than Hinduism. And so already then at the end, the Chan Sang was on the way to the exit of Hinduism. Then when the party was reconstituted in 1980, they didn't promise anything Hindu anymore. You, you, you will look in vain in their, uh, their charter for something like Hindu Rashtra, totally not there. They wanted to swear an oath to secularism. I mean, is that what we needed a new party for? All the other parties were already ready to secularism in the Indian sense of the word. So you see, people who expect something Hindu from the BJP might be deluded. I mean, they are just not, not up to date. They live in 1951. And this, of course, is also true for a group that perhaps you don't care about, but, you know, that I uh, have to live with, which is all the Indologists, all the India watchers worldwide. When they speak about the BJP, they speak about the John Sang. You see, when they always attribute uh, Hindu fanaticism and they want to create a Hindu Rashtra and so on, well, no. The BJP doesn't want that. So there is a core of truth in this, namely if you refer to what the BJP originally had been, but now it is just no longer there. But so that these foreigners have their reason not to notice the change that has taken place in the party, you know, that is their problem. But all the common Hindus have this idea that now finally Hindu Rashtra has set in. I mean, in 2014, when 
Narendra Modi won the elections. I remember it was an enormous sphere of expectation. And, you know, me too, I thought that the, uh, the situation in India had completely changed. I, in fact, wrote somewhere a repeat of Jawaharlal Nehru's independence speech that, you know, a day which comes but rarely when we step from the old into the new, when the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance and so on. I thought, you see, this is all going to happen under Modi. Well, it didn't. But that is a fact that we have to face. And so in, in the future, when the present day equation won't play anymore, then people will notice with some amusement or consternation that this, um, this India watching has consistently for years and years on end misreported or perhaps honestly but naively misunderstood the Indian situation. And constantly invented some Hindu fanaticism that was nowhere to be seen. Okay, well, um, the situation is that once in a while, um, Hindus on, on social media, some, sometimes in more formal forums, constantly express their dismay at what this government is doing. And so people loyal to the government not so much the government spokesmen themselves, they prefer to pretend that nothing is happening, that there is no problem. But their bhaktas, their, uh, their loyalists, and there are very many of them, you see, constantly tell you that, uh, no, you see, this is, a, this is a masterstroke, you see. You don't notice how this is a good policy, but they have a secret strategy of which you are not uh, not good enough to see you know the fruits uh, what is going to bring but one day you see he'll spring a surprise on you and reveal what benefits he is now uh, realizing well so the government does not so much uh, care about this whole debate but the rank and file does and so Many are totally loyal to the government, whatever it does. And I mean, I've had all these choice uh, expressions of this, this childlike loyalty uh, that now we have to stand behind our leaders. And, and they, they use, in fact, the, the observation that there is essentially a warlike situation going on. And they say it's precisely in war that you have to stand between your commanders uh, and indeed, you see, there the comparison of war makes sense. In, in a war, also, soldiers are not expected to disobey. I mean, that's what you have the army disciplined for. In a critical situation, this is totally important. You have to be able to rely on uh, the people you are working with. But then, armies are also known to, to lose the battle. And so all those soldiers in the losing army, they were all loyal. They did not, uh, they were not defective in loyalty. So maybe that's not good enough, you see. The point is that the commanders uh, have their field of uh, decision-making, and that's not what the common soldiers are privy to. But, you know, we happen to know that even the generals make mistakes and consequential mistakes. And maybe a soldier is not expected to comment on that, but we as outsiders are. And so we do notice that many of the things that the BJP does are not going to contribute to the goal that the soldiers think they are fighting for, namely perhaps formally a Hindu Rashtra, but at any rate something of Hindu interest, somehow furthering the concerns of uh, Hindu civilization. That's not really happening. And, and the, uh, the case that we can now focus on as a, as a very good example of this is uh, the case of Nupur Sharma. You see, Nupur Sharma had been uh, provoked 
by uh, slurs against Shiva, against the Shiva Lingam, between brackets. I am aware that the Shiva Lingam has a reference, arguably a reference, to the uh, male anatomy, lends itself easily to being lampooned. And indeed, Hindus among themselves also do that. I mean, if you drop by a company of people in the late hours, you see they're joking and they're, uh, they're also telling jokes about Shiva and about his lingam. And that's allowed, you see, that's, that's perfectly fine for Hindus. That's not in a, in a, in a ritual context. You, go, you don't go into a temple where people are conducting the uh, sacrifices to, to Shiva, the, the puja to Shiva, and there interrupt them by telling jokes about Shiva. But nevertheless, there are contexts when this is perfectly allowed. And so uh, perhaps it was not such a great threshold for the enemies of Hinduism to tap into that register of language. Anyway, so she felt provoked and she did something that spokesmen of public institutions really should never do in a TV debate, which is to lose your cool. She, uh, she got quite emotional to the extent that ultimately the uh, the moderator interrupted her, saying, "Oh, let's let's keep our calm." So that's that's the only thing that you could hold against her. But what she said was perfectly fine. I mean, I might remind you, she essentially said two things about. Uh, Mohammed. So uh, if if we're going to lampoon uh, Shiva, well, we might also take on Mohammed. Namely, what about his Miraj, his uh, celestial journey on a winged horse? You see, are you willing to take that seriously? Or uh, the fact that he married Aisha at six and consummated the marriage at nine? And so that uh, that was too much. Now, why? Uh, of course, I, I suppose you all know by now that what she said was impeccably true. Of course, Islamic tradition contains this story about the uh, heavenly journey on a winged horse and so on. And it also contains the information very explicitly and repeatedly that in his 50s, Muhammad married an underage girl. And that's not even controversial. <laughs> All the Muslims agree to that. So, what to do with that? So the BJP, as you must have heard by now, reacted very negatively. It uh, threw her out as a spokesman and even as a party member and declared that they didn't want anything to do with this, that this was shameful and all that. And when a number of Muslim countries gave statements to that same effect that, that this was an insult to the Prophet and so on, that this should not be tolerated, the uh, Indian government hurriedly fell in line. The um, Bhaktas, as is their want, of course, defended the decision of the government. And in this case, they had, a, they had something sensible to consider. Namely, there are 8 million Indians working in the Gulf states or in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula. And um, their livelihood might be in danger. Isn't that worth sacrificing? the job of a single uh, BJP worker for. Well, of course, I am not at all advocating a policy that endangers the situation of these uh, 8 million people. But there are perfectly uh, ways to avoid that. 
You see, perhaps you could have sidelined her as the party spokesman because she had lost her pool. But contents wise, well, you see, when you meet the ambassador of Qatar or Saudi Arabia or so, you could say, oh, yeah, you see the way she behaved, that was not, uh, that was not appropriate. Uh, yeah. But uh, as for what she said, and there you can open a conversation. You don't have to take it completely lying down, as the BJP has done now, has completely crawled through the dust in front of their enemies. Uh, well, enemies, they're not necessarily enemies. They're just different states, you know, your partners. They need not have become enemies. But um, you could have done something. Like, for example, I suggest here, here I am giving advice, free advice to the BJP government. What they could have done is uh, said to these, these Islamic worthies, oh yeah, what she said, uh, I don't know. You see, this is, a, this is a bit controversial. Did she say anything that was wrong? I mean, here, you are the Muslim, you can tell me. Is this not correct what she said? Uh, did the Prophet do these things? And then, of course, your Muslim spokesman who knows very well the facts and who knows that all the other Muslims also know the facts will find it difficult to uh, give a satisfactory answer. You see, that'll put him on the defensive. I mean, all the Muslims know that Muhammad married this little girl and so on. This is just, just obvious. And so they might not take in this position of uh, now we're going to punish India and, and throw off these 8 million people as well. No, you see, they would have been reduced to uh, facing the rather unimportant fact that somebody has quoted something from the Hadith, from the, the traditions of the Prophet. And that would have been it. You see, this India that agreed to make this a big affair, to, to make something out of this. And I mean, nobody would have bothered. You see, normally, normally Muslims don't like to draw attention to the fact of uh, Muhammad's child marriage, because they know that in today's world, this isn't very much appreciated. And so the fact that now it was out in the open ought to have been an embarrassment for them. And instead it became an embarrassment for the Indian government, for the Hindu side. Why? Because they had been so eager to appease the Islamic side that, you see, they, uh, they stopped facing facts. Something came over them, some you know, ghost possession or something, that um, they too lost their cool. And so it was perfectly possible to handle this situation without any disasters happening, without uh, losing your dignity. Now, why has this happened? You see, the BJP could have handled this without Ajit Doha going to to Tehran, to, to, to beg them, uh, to, to, to plead uh, guilty and to, you know, to kowtow and to, to blame themselves. They didn't have to do that if they had first thought of these things. You see, the point is that they have no ideological backbone. They have a very, very vague notion of what these religions stand for. They, just like the secularists, in fact, the secularists usually uh, have no idea of what Islam and other religions really stand for. You know, for them, religions are interchangeable boxes. 
you know, you can exchange the red box for the yellow box and it won't make a difference. Whereas in reality, religions are very distinctive or distinct uh, entities that are not interchangeable at all. So here the uh, BJP puts itself in the position of the secularists. This is at the level of consciousness. You know, what decisions they, they took, you can analyze from a political viewpoint, is it good foreign policy and so on. But ultimately what it comes down to is that they simply had no consciousness of, of what is now happening, you see. The, the conflict that is now that is now playing itself out as a consequence of the the Gyan Wapi uh, controversy. Why is this? It's like in Ayodhya. You see, on Ayodhya too, they didn't understand, uh, or they didn't want to understand. Uh, Ayodhya had been a problem created by Islamic iconoclasm. And so at that time already, the, uh, the BJP and related Hindu organizations said, oh, it was because Bavar was a foreign invader and Rama was an Indian hero. Well, no, there are so many foreign invaders who have not destroyed temples who even became champions of Indian philosophical or religious systems, like uh, the Greeks who became Buddhist or who became Krishna worshippers and so on. The, even the British, the British did terrible things in India, no doubt at all, but they did not break temples. So if Babar did it, it's not because he was a foreign invader, it is because he belonged to a particular religion that told him to do so. So back then already, if you, if you reread uh, what the BJP wrote about it, they always try to present it as a national versus foreign issue rather than uh, an issue between two religions. So here also, um, they will try anything but absolutely avoid uh, religious anger. Now, I can understand that politicians have other things on their mind than the fine points of religious doctrine. Maybe they didn't know very exactly what this was about, but there is a very uh, good Hindu example of what uh, leaders have to do in times of doubt, they have to consult with a sage or some of them, several of them. And so the, the great example in history is uh, Chanakya. Chanakya who helped uh, Chandragupta Maurya to his empire. And he gave very good advice. So here also, they could have consulted with some people who knew the subject. And that, I mean, there aren't that many people, and I think I know most of them. Uh, <laughs> they were not asked by the government to, uh, to tell them what to do. On the contrary, the um, many politicians have this uh, very ultimately fatal, but at least very uh, unfortunate, tendency to uh, be smug and very self-satisfied, self-righteous, and they are in no mood to consult with anyone. And so they, uh, well, they think that, you know, what they think in the short run in their, with their limited vision is in their best interest. So they say, oh yeah, yeah, the 8 million people and so on. Well, these 8 million people are not necessarily threatened in their livelihood. That's an invention of the Indian secularists. Now, in Qatar, they haven't said, oh, we're going to throw all the Indian engineers and teachers and cleaning ladies and so on out. You know, that's an invention of the Indian secularists. 
I mean, you see, no matter how Islamic they are, they are also, you know, part of the world and they have to take into account all these worldly considerations. So just throwing the economy into disarray because of uh, somebody who said something allegedly offensive, that's not necessarily going to happen. You see, that was only said by the secularists in order to intimidate the Hindus. And so there is perhaps still enough Hindu left in the BJP leaders to be able to get intimidated. And so they did. That's what they did. So you see, there it is necessary to just uh, stop for a moment and get some good information, get some good advice. And so for that, you don't have to go to just anyone. You go to the people who know the subject. Ah. Well, you see, that has not been uh, that has not been done as uh, you must have heard. So this is a a, a very um, a very grave hurdle that people are not willing to do the best. You see, they just have no interest in victory. They don't even know that there is a civilizational battle going on. I mean, the, the sun is shining and. You see, I'm doing my usual work every day and so on. You know, if I look around, I, I don't see this civilizational battle going. And if I turn on the TV and so on, I get all kinds of distractions and this civilizational battle. Well, you need a few people who are conscious about this, who raise consciousness about this. Otherwise, you might you know, spend your life and just uh, be ignorant. Well, that is the, um, the first and the main hurdle that people just don't focus on the goal. You know, what the enemies want is Hindu society to disappear. I mean, really, you know, impress this upon your mind. What they want is for Hinduism to forget about itself, Hindus ought to convert, and Hinduism will become something like uh, museums uh, holding the pharaohs, I mean the pharaonic uh, arts and so on. Something nice to look at on a Sunday afternoon, but uh, nothing serious. That's the future they have in mind for Hindus. And mind you, they do not always describe this as a conflict. They also think, on the Christian side, they don't even think it is a conflict. They think they are just doing good for you. They're taking you to heaven rather than to hell. You know, they, they say they, they sell Christianity to you because they love you. Ah, here there is another big hurdle. It is that Hindus systematically misrepresent to others and to themselves the motives of their enemies. They say, oh yeah, Christians are imperialists and colonialists and so on. Well, that's not how Christians see it. You see, in, in the first centuries in the Roman Empire, the Christians were a nervous little minority and they had no colonial or racist or so ambitions. They just tried to make their flock grow, and that they did quite successfully. And um, so the situation in India today is the same, you see. Colonialism is a thing of the past. Racism is a thing of the past. Most of the missionaries you're going to encounter in India are not Westerners. And so you have to focus on what Christianity itself has to offer, not of its historical association with colonialism and so on. Uh, they themselves, at any rate, have long outgrown that. And so their strategies also are devised to meet the new situation. Um, among Muslims, strictly speaking, of course, they are very open about the conflict aspect of the whole situation. For them, India is a territory of war where uh, Islam has to, uh, has to prevail in the end. 
But they too, if you really ask them, are going to tell you that they only want your good. After all, as a non-Muslim, you're going to uh, end up in hell. And as a Muslim, there are all these beautiful things waiting for you. So it's good for you to become a Muslim. And so, you see, Hindus tend to fantasize that, you know, the other side is evil. And, you know, even though what they do is evil, namely to destroy Dharmic civilization, nevertheless, they have no evil in mind. You see, they are just swayed by this strange doctrine. And because of that doctrine, good people are going to do evil things. And I think it's an American physicist, Steven Weinberg, who has said this. You know, no matter what you see, always good people are going to do good and evil people are going to do evil. But for good people to do evil, that takes religion. Now, there, of course, he made no... Uh, no distinction between the different religions that happen to be quite different. But I guess, I mean, he, um, he had a point. And so the correct understanding of the Islamic challenge is that all those people are misled by an ideology and that they may perfectly well leave that, uh, that conditioning behind. And indeed, there are many ex-Muslims nowadays who have left Islam behind. But so that is something you have to keep in mind and that the um, struggle against Islam ultimately is not some fairy tale struggle against uh, the evildoers, against the asuras or so. No, you see, it's... Uh, Ultimately, ultimately about um, freeing people, <laughs> about setting people free from their conditioning, and maybe, uh, especially by the doings of the uh, adversary, this will bring some conflict, but ultimately that's not what you want. You see, the... Um, Hindus sometimes give the impression that they are eager for a fight, spoiling for a fight. And so that's when the cameras appear, when they want to have uh, this uh, Yati Narasimha Nanda say out loud that we should uh, kill Muslims, we should get guns and, you know, finish them off and so on. I think that was just the couch potato uh, shooting off his mind and not intending to do anything of the sort. But that's also very common among Hindus. They are great, uh, great talkers, but fortunately, they usually don't have these, uh, they, they don't take these, uh, these plans seriously. But uh, at any rate, it's a mistake, you see. It shows, again, a lack of consciousness of what this is all about. You know, if you're going to have a conflict, it must be because the other side is starting the conflict. It's an important criterion of just war, that the war has to be defensive. And so if they really want to fight, well, then Shivaji and Baji Rao and other greats in Hindu history have shown them, yeah, I mean, if you want a fight, we can give you a fight. Okay, that's, that's fine. But it is important to realize that that fight ultimately is a consequence of the attitude of the other side and that you don't want a fight. And um, so it's very, very important to keep that in mind. Ultimately, this is a battle of consciousness. And the Nupur Sharma incident was a very, very beautiful opportunity to raise that consciousness. Again, the BJP ministers could have told very naively looking 
any Islamic word is okay. What, you know, I'm only a Hindu. You see, I don't know anything about this Islam, about this Muhammad. You tell me, you know, did he marry this child bride or not? You know, that would have raised consciousness. There are, for instance, many Muslims, many ordinary Muslims who have this very idealized picture of Muhammad. And so if you draw attention to the fact that they know, but that they never think about, that he, uh, he had this child bride, maybe, maybe they would think twice. You see, that would set the process in motion of questioning Islam. So the, the, the BJP leadership had a beautiful opportunity to do that. And they would have done so if they had understood what this, this whole uh, incident is about, what this whole civilizational struggle is about. And so since they want to do only day-to-day -day politics and uh, simply enjoy the perks of office without doing anything with it, they miss their opportunity. So that ultimately is uh, is my uh, my message that the Hindu leaders have to go back to the source and realize what this struggle is all about. But you see, I'm not going to say too much about uh, what the struggle is all about. I agree that this is perhaps too difficult. Let's summarize it as something very simple. It's ultimately about survival. And so that is something that everybody ought to be able to understand. Now, Indians are going to survive, but Hindus may not. There, of course, you're going to have the problem that, especially the BJP, is going to say, ah, but we, are, we don't care about Hindus, we care about Indians. And, you know, systematically they have replaced the word Hindu with the word Indian. And they call themselves nationalists rather than Hindu. And perhaps they, that is what they mean. And, you know, here you have a problem, you see, maybe they are already effectively apostates from the Hindu cause. You know, it's maybe it's not opportunism. Maybe it is really a change of consciousness, and that is suggested by the recent incident where they replaced saffron with blue, simply in the lettering of their uh, their their conference theme or something. It's it's a very clear, very emphatic taking distance from those in the party who still have Hindu interests in mind. You see, they absolutely don't want to be reminded of that. So as far as they are concerned, Hindus are orphans. They have no one to care for. It. There is no party that takes their interests to heart. I am afraid that by now we have reached the situation unless maybe it's too much to hope for a change of mind among Hindu leaders. But what can certainly happen, what can certainly happen is that among the lower rank and files, people are biding their time and are ready to take over. You see, such things happen in parties that suddenly uh, a new generation comes and brings in a new emphasis, uh, a new doctoral orientation. And such people are, of course, present in plenty inside the BJP, inside the broader RSS movement. People who do not enthusiastically follow the present leadership, but um, who have once in their young days joined the party because they wanted to do something for Hindus. Because they still thought, rightly or wrongly, that this was a Hindu party and that this was the way to serve the Hindu cause. Now, some of them may well rise to the top at some point 
and bring back these uh, Hindu ideals. That's not, uh, not strictly impossible. I do not see any signs of it at the moment, but it might strictly happen. You know, that's, that's the, the reason why I think Hindus should not be too, uh, too eager to give up on the BJP. Right now, I hear many Hindus say, yeah, we should found a new party and uh, show the BJP what uh, a real Hindu party is. That new party doesn't even have to then cobble together a majority. No, because once the BJP people, as opportunists, see that a Hindu party can have some success, then they will change their party line and become more Hindu again. Okay, that's 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 what some some Hindus are saying. And this, you know, on the face of it, this is logical. Only it takes some work, some doing. And so here again is a big hurdle for Hindu success. It is that well. Negatively speaking, there is a lot of tamas around. You see people on their couch giving comments, often very good comments, but not following these up with action. Today, to found a party is still a big job. It's much less than in the past, thanks to the modern media, but it's still a big job, and it seems that nobody has the stomach for that job. You know, here we have to admire Dr. Het at the time, who founded the RSS, out of nothing. Whatever else can be said about the line taken by the RSS, at any rate, to create an organization like that would motivate people to the tune of six million is the latest, latest figure I've heard about their membership. Uh, that is very impressive. And so nobody now feels ready to do something similar. I have myself in conversation with those people suggested, well, you might reform the BJP from the inside by creating a tendency within the party, you know, as has happened in a number of other parties in the democratic world, like the militant tendency within the British Labour Party of the 70s, 80s, or the Tea Party within the Republican Party of the United States in maybe 20 years ago. Or indeed the Hindu Mahasabha, which was originally a tendency within the Congress Party that got thrown out of the Congress Party. Back then already they were militantly secularists. Uh, or the Congress Socialist Party, which tried to influence and rather more successfully the Congress into a, a leftward uh, policy. So maybe that's what you could do. That's much less, uh, much less expensive, much less labor intensive. But even that nobody's doing. And so I see a lot of uh, Hindu wailing about the, uh, the present uh, government's uh, policies, but he's doing anything about it. And nobody is even devising a plan, you see, what can we do about it? Or even, you see, how can we influence the present leadership? Uh, except by writing tweets and hoping that somehow they reach Narendra Modi, but you see, there's no plan about what, what to do here. So that's, that's another big hurdle for Hindus. The fact that they accept the status quo, even when the status quo at the moment means that their precious time. So, I mean, at the moment, we have to face the fact that the the Hindu cause is orphaned. It's not served by the BJP. It's in fact very contemptuously disregarded 
by the BJP, they even make very explicit gestures, like using blue instead of saffron, in order to just uh, show their independence from what is actually their vote bank, their support base, namely the Hindu masses. And so at the moment, you see this enormous potential of this shrinking but still very large Hindu society is somehow not being put to effective use. In fact, all these Hindus, all these Hindus are providing the votes uh, that then, and thereby providing the political power, that then is siphoned off to other purposes, to non-Hindu purposes, in fact, even to uh, provide extra finances for Muslim scholarships and Muslim entrepreneurship and so on. But not to any, uh, to, to not to any Hindu causes. Well, you know, if that can be done, then something will have to be done. And at the moment, at the moment, I only notice that Hindus are orphaned and are not yet ready to go anywhere specific. And so personally, personally, I still think it is possible to re-Hinduize the uh, BJP, but not that I can see how. You see, in theory, I think this is possible. And I'm always ready for surprises. But again, like with uh, not counting on pujas, you can also not count on the mere possibility that something will happen. So at the moment, I am not here to give you a miracle uh, formula to solve the situation. Let's first really impress upon ourselves what the situation is, namely that the Hindu cause is totally orphaned, as it has often been in the past. But at least, you see, in the time of the John Sang, there was a hope, you see, there is someone who cares for us, someone who is not in power, but at least, you see, we have somewhere to turn to. Well, that's not even the case anymore today. Now the real hurdle that is making all this possible is that Hindus have this fatal tendency to hero worship. When uh, Ram Swarup wrote his very first uh, booklet called Indictment, which was a um, critical reflection afterwards of the Quit India movement of 1942, in which he himself had actively participated. The foreword was written by the later philosophy professor Daya Krishna. And the very first sentence is, Hindus have a terrible tendency to hero worship. The bane of Indian politics is he hero worship. And so um, that was at that time about Mahatma Gandhi. You see, Hindus can follow totally foolish policies because there is this hero Mahatma Gandhi telling them to do so. And now we have Narendra Modi in the same role. You see, very many, numerous, millions of Hindus are willing to follow him to the ends of the earth and are not noticing that their original motivation, oh yeah, let's serve Hinduism, let's serve a Hindu leader, ah, that's Narendra Modi, let's serve Narendra Modi. You see, that initial motivation is not about anything real anymore. You see, whatever Modi may have been in the past, right now he's leading Hindu society somewhere else. And still they don't notice because they have this hero worship. Now, I told you that I was not going to make myself very well liked among Hindus. So now I'm going to say something really terrible. This tendency to hero worship has a historic foundation. 
and uh, it's it's now very ingrained in, in really existing Hinduism already for thousands of years. The cult of uh, Rama and Krishna and of the other avatars of Vishnu is exactly the problem we are now discussing, namely hero worship. I mean, that's literally what is going on. These people are being worshipped. There are temples for them and songs for them and so on. They are treated like uh, an incarnation of, of Vishnu. They are treated like God on earth. And yet they are historical figures. That's why they have a birthplace temple. Human beings are born at some point. Whatever else they may be different in, they're all born. And so they were historical figures. They have a place in the, 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 the king lists. And so they did all the human things. They got married. They, uh, well, and they also had affairs. No, Krishna did, not Rama. But um, they fought wars and... You know, they had all kinds of family relations, friends, enemies. So they were just human beings. And then uh, a few generations after their death, uh, they were seen as essentially fulfilling the role that within the pantheon Vishnu has to play, which is to maintain dharma. And so they were seen as incarnations of uh, Vishnu. And that was then ever more formalized into a distinct cult of distinct divine figures. These human beings had become divine figures. And so these human beings are being worshipped. Human beings who were fallible human beings, who were very remarkable human beings, but nevertheless were of the same kind as every one of us. So they are elevated ever higher and seen as gods. Well, that exactly is hero worship. And so this I see on a smaller scale being repeated now. It was being repeated with Mahatma Gandhi, who uh, led uh, Hindus into a trap. Maybe he could not have prevented partition, but he could have prevented the atrocities of partition. There was an alternative formula, best known through B. Uh, R. Ambedkar, of uh, an orderly exchange of population. So that that could have happened. And you see, the British, as more or less neutral uh, participants, were still around to to sort of police this whole process. So this could have been done. Well, um, Gandhi put his foot down. You see, uh, no, no, you see. Uh, no exchange of population. Uh, no, no, the Muslims should remain here. And so everything you got since, every, everything you got then, which is the partition massacres, but also all the uh, communal trouble ever since. And I don't only mean the riots and the people killed, but also the enormous political energy wasted on the communal question. That is all due to the prevention of an orderly partition in favor of the partition we now got, the uh, communal chaos ever since. So that's what uh, hero worship can do. And I'm afraid that today's hero worship may prove equally fatal. So, I don't know if it's uh, within the power of Hindus to outgrow their hero worship, at least for this special occasion. Uh, but it'll it'll be it'll have to be necessary because for today, any uh, politics really focused on Hindu interests, I I don't see it around. I don't see any Hindu moving in that direction. And so the alternative is that you're going to have this secularist government, you're going to have minority appeasement and so on under the BJP. And later when the BJP loses, certainly also under the other parties. And so 
the decline of uh, Hindu society is going to continue until the end. Um, so that's uh, that's the happy prospect I have for you. So um, I could quote, of course, the demographic figures, which show an ever, ever, ever progressing decline of Hindu numbers. But there's also more subtle things. Uh, the uh, decrease in Hindu contents of the cultural production, the movies and so on, of the school books and so on, people are becoming more and more estranged from, from Dharma. And so if it depends on the situation of India, it looks like this is just going to progress till the end. Now, that doesn't mean that the end is forever. In this sense, it is, of course, a sanatana. It will come back, uh, but not, not, not in the same form, of course. Like, for instance, what can happen is that the much maligned West will provide help. You see, there is a an increase in the harmic contents in the West, not just people converting to Hare Krishna or so, but more and more ideas from Hinduism are becoming more common. Uh, like uh, as a philosopher, I happen to know that in philosophy departments across the West, there is a big churning going on, like, yeah, we should bring in more of these oriental philosophies and they're still a bit reluctant but it is it is coming this is an evolution that is taking place and so the identification of christian west that is an obsolete thing the west is more and more open to uh oriental philosophies in general but the hindu philosophies in particular um and so Maybe you see the rest of the world can provide what India itself cannot. I only think it's a bit of a sad scenario. You see, uh, but you see, at the moment, at any rate, it is what everybody can see. You know, whereas the foreign press is still reporting on uh, channel side of Indian Muslims threatened by the ugly, vicious uh, Hindu fundamentalists. The reality is that more and more Hindus are getting killed and raped and so on every day. And so, you know, for, for a while I thought that the age of communal violence was over. But, you know, I was, uh, I was too eager to believe that. And so, no, it is not over. And we'll get more of it. And so, once again, it proves that there is a war going on. It's a reminder, you see, in, in themselves, these uh, violent incidents are not that important, but they constantly remind you that there is a war going. And so this war is going to go on even without these incidents. The war is, cannot be reduced to religious rights. It's far more fundamental. Nevertheless, they provide a reminder that you can't just uh, sit down and forget about this. You know, this is an issue that is that is that is demanding your attention. So, may I say something very unhindu? You see, as an ex-Catholic, I um, had always learned that the uh, the great theological virtues are the law of hope, faith, hope and charity and so faith means of course that you believe in the true faith that's obvious then uh, charity well that's a nice virtue and it's not very different from similar virtues in chinese and indian and every other civilization, but okay, it's, uh, it's interesting. But what is less understood is hope. And so for a Christian, 
it is uh, deemed unbecoming to lose hope. You know, uh, that should always be there in situations of total despair. You should maintain hope. And so that uh, might be a useful thing to remember in the present situation that the Dharma finds itself. So um, this uh, this hopeless situation need not be that hopeless, but the given the the Hindu uh, known participation in this struggle, the solution will have to come from elsewhere, and that's quite possible. First of all, it may still come from the Hindus, but in a different way. Namely, that they create the right vibrations, you know, when they do, when they do yajna for, you know, with the, as their sankal, you know, we're going to create uh, uh, a utopia, you know, a Hindu state. Why not? Maybe that has an effect, but I don't know about that. But you see other uh, tendencies that are happening are the increasing valuation of dharma by outsiders and especially and especially the uh, increasing doubt about Islam among Muslims and of Christianity among Christians. You know, about the last part, I can tell you my personal story, which is that when I was a child, most people I know in my country were practicing Christians. Today, practically none are. Now, in the Muslim world, this is less likely, and especially in India, because there they have this situation of polarization with Hindus, which uh, makes them averse to disloyalty. So they will, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to break ranks with their community when they have an adversary in place. That adversary means no harm to them, I mean the Hindus, but they don't know that. They keep on telling each other that this is a formidable enemy and so on. So they themselves have the psychology of, uh, of war, of lining up against the other one. But still, this uh, doubt about Islam is a uh, is insinuating itself into the Muslim community. You don't see it here that much. You see it already a little bit more in Arabia. You see a lot of it in the Muslim community in the West. So maybe that will save Hinduism in the long run. So I I am not without hope. It's just that right now that, that um, that solution is not coming from the Hindu side. And so that, I'm afraid, is, uh, is the main hurdle at the moment. You see, Hindus are not coming out to look after their own civilizational interests. Maybe because they're not interested, maybe because they take it for granted, maybe because they think nothing can happen to it because I know Hinduism has already survived so many crises and so on. I mean, there are very many reasons not to be interested. But at any rate, with that mentality of non-interest, I'm afraid you're going to lose the war. And so that is what I uh, would like to avoid. Thank you. Firstly, what you mentioned about the Mukul Sharma debate. I am absolutely with you, just like many, many other Hindus, that the manner in which the government handled this by suspending Mukul Sharma and all was a bit much. Because the way things were in India, it was quite clear that the Muslim side was very angry about what was happening with Gyan Bapi, with this whole sense of what they were seeing as takeover, that Mukul Sharma was just an excuse. They would have grabbed at anything to just run this down. And mm -hmm. we all know the power they have online and everything to make this uh, a big controversy. Nevertheless, yes, BJP government could have handled this better. But the second point which you mentioned um, about, yes, because there are uh, a lot of economic interests at play and India didn't do enough. 
I don't know if many people know, I myself got to know this through a Swaraj article last week, that India has actually subtly hit back at uh, Saudi Arabia. Now Saudi Arabia is not the number two oil supplier, now Russia is. So we actually got into a relationship with Russia. So Saudi Arabia has now come down to number three. Uh, Iraq is number one for India, for oil supplies, mm. and uh, Russia is number two. So that was a very, very good move, in my opinion, sir, because uh, it really does tell them that, look, you know, you can try, but your business interests are also going to be taken because we are a big uh, market. And I think somewhere subtly that message has gone across. Uh, that said, yes, a lot more needs to be done in that direction so that we don't appear weak. My other point is actually what you're saying. A lot of it is not what the masses of Hindus are going to be in agreement with, sir. Because if you look at BJP's manifesto, they have ticked off all the boxes. Whether it is Article 370, it's a different matter what's happening in Kashmir, because that is anyway going to take time to settle down. Whether it is uh, Ram Mandir. So all that is happening, all that which Hindus never imagined would ever happen, mm -hmm. is actually happening right now. The takeover that is going to, and the kind of movements and the cases that are happening. Do you really believe that if BJP had not been in power, sir, in both Uttar Pradesh and at the center, these cases would have been in court? They would even be getting a hearing. There would be even be inquiries going on, video filming. We are getting close to getting our mandir back. So we are going to be the only civilization in the world, actually, which has claimed it back. And that is what is getting uh, uh, Muslims angry. Nobody else has done it, you know, that we are actually taking it. This is also happening. Because I'm not a lawyer. I wonder why is it that in all these decades, nobody filed a case for getting back uh, of, uh, for Kashi Mandir, you know. So how do you see that? So paradoxically, they're ticking off all the boxes. He, they did say that Ram Mandir will happen whenever, how many, from 1980s, mm -hmm. I think, I'm not sure. But um, they did it. So even though it's okay. progressing slowly, it's happening. So how do we, and Narendra Modi ji's popularity, as you know, is right up there. Your points are absolutely agree with. We need to do more. Hindus need to fight more. But there is this little bit of a confusion. I'm afraid <laughs> that I have to disagree with her because okay. um, I, I don't think that uh, with the, um, the oil purchases in Saudi Arabia versus Russia, India has hit back. I mean, there was simply this opportunity to buy cheap oil in Russia Russian. that has opened up thanks to the Ukraine war. And that's what was what India was going to do anyway. That's not hitting back. Then this, uh, you know, Temple Mosque case. Okay. Do you think anybody would have taken it to trial? Well, I know that mm -hmm. Ayodhya has been under trial since 1950 when Congress was all powerful of course it was much more of a hindu party back then than it is today but still the judiciary has a certain independence and that is why the main court verdict of which the supreme court verdict about ayodhya was only a, a completion but you see, the decisive turn was taken by the Uttar Pradesh High Court in 2010, yeah. where they gave the verdict allowing the construction of the temples. And so there were some provisions for Muslims, they should also get something and so on. But the really decisive point was the exact location. What's going to happen with that? Well, mm -hmm. the Hindus are going to have. So that was the decision, and it was taken when the BJP was neither in power in the center nor in UP. So, I mean, that's uh, my compliment for the Indian judiciary, which proves to be independent. And so when today people say, oh, you know, this is thanks to the BJP government, and this is said again, as so often, by both the friends of the BJP and its enemies. Okay, it's it's only us, you see, that 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 little group of diehards, you know, that criticize this. But yes, you see, most BJP people and, and most Indians, you know, do think that this is because of the BJP that the the Ayodhya situation has been cleared. Well, uh, no, I mean. Or, or maybe, I mean, yes. maybe there are things happening that I am not uh, privy to. It is. But mm -hmm. um, 
but you see, to say that the judiciary uh, looks to the government in order to decide what it is going to be its verdict, that's a very, very, very serious uh, attack on the judiciary and on the whole rule of law. You see, you have a separation of powers with the government being totally separate from the judiciary and vice versa. And so if you're going to say, oh, they tailor their verdict to the wishes of the government, I mean, that's that's to say that this is a, a thin pop dictatorship. You know, I mean, I have too much respect for India as it is to say that. I mean, though I know that all kinds of corruptions and so on are taking place also in the judiciary, nevertheless, for this high profile case where everybody had his eyes on, it would have been already a little bit more difficult to get away with that. And anyway, I mean, I, I don't see any evidence of this. And I mean, this is a court case that I've studied. You know, I don't see any evidence of this, you know, being being uh, done on behalf of the government. So very different governments were around in 2010 versus now. And yet the, the verdict goes in the same direction. Uh, so, no, I think that uh, the, the evidence that the judges had to deal with was mm -hmm. such that they had to concede mm -hmm. the place to the Hindus, no matter who is in government. As for Gyanwapi, that Hindus never file the court case, uh, well, first of all, of course, they had their temple already. You see, they have the Golden Temple just next to and that was built by Ahilya Bhokar, uh, Ahilya Bhokar who, um, of course, very certainly had the interests of Hindu civilization in mind. So in the circumstances, he thought that that was the most that, that could reasonably be obtained. And so Hindus have adapted to that situation. And so they weren't thinking as far ahead as to uh, retake the uh, the Gyanwapi Mosque, and then now with the developments in Ayodhya, then suddenly you see this this became thinkable, and then someone has taken this to court. But I don't think that they needed the BJP government for that. So here, sorry to say, but you see here I recognize the typical Bhakt discourse of you know putting rosy colors on everything the BJP does. And so you see, sometimes it works out well, like for instance on Kashmir. Now that is the big achievement of the Modi government so far. Of course, now in the background, I hear economists and some comment, no, 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 no. You see, you are too uh, gone with all these uh, communal issues. The real action is in economics, where they have done this and that. I don't know about that. But you see, at least uh, as far as the uh, communal things are concerned, there, of course, the renormalization of Kashmir was indeed a great achievement. And I say renormalization because what they did was simply to, to give Kashmir the normal status. I mean, in no country in the world do you have the situation that some province is off limits to its other citizens. Uh, so this was also a fairly easy thing to explain to foreign governments, for example. Very few of them have protested. So it was a good thing to do. I absolutely applaud it. However, very typical. It was not a Hindu Muslim issue. Of course, we know that Kashmir had a special status because of its Muslim majority, but that's not present in any article of law. Uh, moreover, there is the fact that uh, even, even the Maharaja Hari Singh before all also toyed with the idea of independence and so on. So that can also be used in order to decommunalize uh, the whole issue to say that it's not, you know, just a Muslim demand and so on. Anyway, so the, what the BJP had to deal with was an article of the constitution in which you do not have the words Hindu or Muslim. Now that they didn't find too hard to handle. 
you see, from a purely nationalist angle, this normalization of Kashmir had to be done. And so they did it in the name of national unity, which is fine by me. I mean, it's, you know, the fact that I criticize the whole idea of nationalism as a poor substitute for Hindu interests doesn't mean I'm against national unity or so. So they did the right thing. But that cannot be uh, repeated, apparently, once um, Hindu interests, in, in a very explicit sense, are concerned. Like, for instance, the, um, the normalization of Article 30, which today gives rights in uh, education to the minorities, but not to the majority. When that article was voted in the Constituent Assembly, obviously the Hindus present did not intend to take away that right from Hindus, to deny, to deny it to them while conceding it to the minorities. But that interpretation of the article has taken hold of, under Indira Gandhi probably. And so that has led to the situation that Hindu organizations involved in education have felt the need to claim the status of non-Hindu minority because that would protect their school system. So this is a constant spur for Hindus to seek the exit, to uh, leave the sinking ship and to, to fend for themselves, uh, leaving all the other Hindus in the lurch. And so any Hindu party would move to correct that situation. You may not even need to have a change in the constitution for that. Probably it can be settled by having the Supreme Court give an authoritative opinion on the exact meaning of this article. Maybe this article can be reinterpreted again and conceding that, of course, all communities have these same rights, the majority as much as the minorities. And if not, then they can go to parliament, where they have an almost two-thirds majority. It ought not to be difficult to get a um, two-thirds majority together, because the demand you're formulating is so obviously reasonable. And it's a demand not in terms of Hindu Rastra or something. No, it's a demand in terms of equality. Now, who can be against equality? Do you think the Congress or the Communists or so are going to shout from the root of them? We are against equality. Down with equality. Equality is a Hindu to a conspiracy. No, you see this. I mean, really, you know, there you have to play your cards well and get together that majority that ought not to be insurmountable. So, you see, a party that has Hindu, Hindu interests in mind is going to do that. Now, if the BJP has not done it so far, that tells you something about the BJP. So, BJP has done a few nice things, but... Um, I think the really uh, decisive concerns for Hindu interests are not there. They just keep up Hindu support with some empty gestures, like uh, like Narendra Modi goes to unveil the statue of Shankaracharya, and that gets you know on all TV screens and so on. So very many common Hindus at home who. Uh, don't really follow this, but they've seen this image. Oh, yeah, he's a good guy. He's our guy. And so that ensures the votes. That, you know, the Hindus keep voting ultimately for policies that goes against their own interests. And so that is, that is the main job of the BJP right now, is to just channel the Hindu votes, the Hindu political power towards non-Hindu or anti-Hindu goals. Uh, Sri Ram and Sri Krishna were definitely historical figures, but that doesn't preclude them from being Bhagwan, as they embodied those attributes in sublime ways. So the two things aren't mutually exclusive in the typical Hindu way of perception. Mm -hmm. and 
Also, that the Hindu way necessarily requires that a person take stock of their own abilities, where they stand now within their limited context, not yet having reached the zenith of uh, spiritual evolution, which is the ultimate potential of human beings, take stock of that and within their context, apply their minds, use their chaitanya to watch over it and then evaluate other beings. So only the devotion that arises from such a deeply mindfully applied process can be termed devotion. All else obviously amounts to a form of blind devotion, which mm-hmm. is definitely encouraged by Hinduism. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, Hindus definitely are very <clears throat> fascinated due to a whole host of factors that we are already aware of. So I agree with you that a lot of that deracinated, mindless, blind hero worship is occurring. Uh, but I hope you didn't mind me adding this bit of a context. Mm-hmm. To- no, no, I don't mind at all. And so, I mean, I, I am not, you know, I'm not against the worship of Rama or uh, Krishna. No? I only notice that it fosters a certain psychology of uh, Hindu worship, which probably was already there and found utterance through this deification of Rama and Krishna. But, um, you know, that psychology itself, happens i mean maybe there's good things to be said about it but it certainly has the drawback of fostering this uh very uncritical attitude towards policy there is a a a maxim that is often attributed to eleanor roosevelt though she had it from some clergyman whose name i uh never knew but um it goes like this small minds think about persons mediocre minds think about events and big minds think about ideas so what i'm trying to get you to do is to think about ideas to see what is actually at stake you know this uh, this civilizational battle is not something you run into in, in ordinary life. You have to think about it, study for it, and so on. And whereas persons and events you encounter all the time. And so that's, you know, that's the, the sort of default option. So ordinary people care about persons and follow those persons not mindful of the ideas that are animating that person. And so this is now what is happening uh, with Narendra Modi. You see, at the moment, he was very um, embraced by the Hindu population because he seemed to be the embodiment of a pro-Hindu politics, what they yearned for, what they were missing in the BJP. And so uh, he did, in one famous incident, he did refuse to wear a Muslim cap, you know, which even uh, totally secular papers in the West, like The Economist from London, you know, were very indignant about, uh, he doesn't even want to wear a Muslim skull cap. Well, uh, so that, you know, was very much liked by the English. He uh, did not give in when he was attacked left and right for his supposed guilt in the in the Godra riots. So the fact that he did not give in to that that was that endeared him enormously to the Hindu masses, and so he retained that aura of Hindu Hardaya Samrat, Emperor of the Hindu Heart, but. Um, Nobody noticed that the policies he was actually conducting already as chief minister of Gujarat were being less and less pro-Hindu. And so when he was a candidate for um, leading the BJP in 2014, they kept on supporting him, which was interesting because the party leadership did not support him. They wanted to Raj Nath Singh or, or anyone who was not that, as controversial as Narendra Modi. It is the, 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 the mass support that carried him through. And then later the, the party leadership was grateful because after all, he delivered them election victories. 
So nobody noticed that the Hindu contents was becoming less and less. And I mean, all the four India watchers have not even noticed till today. You know, whatever happens, they will always, always explain it as a new height of uh, Hindu fanaticism. But so we know better. And um, this is where hero worship comes in. You see, people see the person, not the policies that he stands for. And they keep seeing the same person, even though the policies have changed completely. And so that's, I mean, that I want to just, uh, you know, draw your attention to. This is an absolutely dangerous problem. This is a problem with very negative consequences. Indians do have a tendency for hero worship, I agree. But it is not that it came from Ramakrishna directly to Modi. After all, we had a father of a nation and a chacha of a nation born sometime in between, whom we <laughs> worshipped for 70 years. Mm-hmm. So yes. I'd, I'd like to say that it's not just Narendra Modi, but it's um, going on. Okay, 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 okay. Well, again, you see, I have nothing against uh, the, the Rama Bhakti and Krishna Bhakti. But um, it is true that, you know, a lot of history has passed since then. And so people are, I mean, and of course, you know, we can't say today what policies Rama or Krishna stood for at the time. That's not what they're worshipped for. Nowadays, they have outgrown whatever historical connotations they may have had there. But so, yes, uh, uh, the example on everybody's mind now is uh, the Mahatma Gandhi case. You see, he did some interesting things for Hinduism. Of course, he was not the great independence leader that people took him for. He was very much a British loyalist. And, um, you know, participating in three different wars on the British side, all three well, wars of which the motives were much less than dharmic. So he supported that. And um, it was only when new tendencies came up in Congress that Purna Swaraj was chosen rather than being the dominion status within the British Empire. But so they stayed loyal to him through these changes, through his... uh, through the disappointments that he caused, like uh, after the Purna Swaraj resolution, there was a big agitation. People, you know, gave up their studies, their jobs and so on to participate because they thought this is a great national moment. We're going to achieve independence. And then at the negotiation table, Gandhi threw it all away and settled for much, much less. So um, they were ready. You saw that he was not not delivering, but still people kept on worshipping him. Then during the partition, of course, it ended in disaster. It, you know, for Gandhi's reputation, it would have been good if one of the many murder attempts on him before 1947 had succeeded. Okay, now this I don't say because I sympathize with murder attempts, not at all, but I just do notice that if you hadn't seen Gandhi in 1947, his aura would have still been shining much more brightly than it is today. So, and and, and still, you see, the Gandhi cult was kept alive even after his death. Of course, it again won a lot of luster thanks to being martyred. But at any rate, you see, no matter what Gandhi had done, I mean, nobody took a critical look at it because he was untouchable in the sense of, you know, um, free from criticism. And even now that is the case because Narendra Modi continues the Gandhi code. I mean, right now in Hindu intellectual circles, that is really a past station. Nobody tries to, you know, act like he's worshipping Gandhi anymore. You know, people are critical of Gandhi. People say openly, no, Subhash Chandra Bose did a lot more for independence than Gandhi. 
they say openly that uh, in his struggle with Ambedkar, you see Gandhi was partly right, partly wrong. Uh, then in partition, of course, he had a very obvious guilt. So, you know, people have outgrown that silly childish uh, veneration for the for the Mahatma. Only Narendra Modi has it. <laughs> so, you see, that's uh, how one hero worship can hide another. And, and um, yeah. It goes on. It's not just the descendants of Gyasuddin Ghazi, but also, I mean, it goes on in the clan because now they're trying to portray. Uh, uh, no, when Indira Gandhi died, she was described as Durga. Uh, when uh, Rajiv yeah. Gandhi died, he was a martyr. And now Papu, uh, Ra Rahul Gandhi is being portrayed as Rajiv Gandhi, you know, wearing the same kind of suits and all. So <laughs> that hero worship. Is in the blood, I think. I'll also yeah. take on, uh, I'll also ask Dipanjali to unmute. Yes, Dr. Else, this is just uh, further to Aditi Ji's question. Yes, our avatars are very dear to us, me included. We are all Sri Krishna. And incidentally, yeah. sir, what you have been telling us in this talk is exactly what Sri Krishna speaks of in the Mahabharata to go out oh. there and fight. That is exactly what you have said. Mm. My observation is something which a friend told me about in 2016, so two years after Narendra Modi Ji came. He said that there is a lot of talk around which he hears that Modi ji is seen as like an avatar of Krishna. And I said, really? Yeah. He said, yes, because Sambhavami Yuge Yuge, as uh, Shri Krishna says, when there is so much attack on dharma, I will come. I will not let you go. That is now we can interpret I will come as in any way. as in. But for many Hindus, he's actually seen as that one person. So the concept of the avatar mm. and the hero worship, I absolutely agree with you. It is a fault. But sometimes it can also be a strength because it galvanizes. That's my observation. Uh, yeah. Just to add to that, mm -hmm. I heard in a talk that it's after a long time, I, after Sri Krishna, we've had one politician who is not a politician, but a statesman. A statesman is someone who can see 100 years ahead for the country. So, well, and who is he? Narendra Modi. I'm a bhakta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Well, I'm not so sure of that. Yeah, that, that people worship him as Krishna, yes, uh, why not? I mean, you know, when, when they worship Indira Gandhi as Durga, that made some sense because even though she was anti-Hindu, you know, all through, she did pull off the victory in the Bangladesh war, which was a very risky thing to do. I mean, it could have gone wrong in, in many different ways. So that she did pull off. Of course, then she wasted the gains made on the battlefield. But I mean, that's less newsworthy. Again, you see, ordinary folk don't follow all that. But a victory in war, now that is important. And so, I mean, if you use that religious language of equating her to Durga, whereas other people would, you know, praise her in different terms, that, that's okay. I mean, that's that's the preferred language. That's okay. You know, it's just that you should not suspend your normal critical sense that you have vis-a-vis -vis ordinary human beings. Um, you remind me of uh, a different uh, hurdle, uh, which is that many, and this is again something I can connect to uh, the body of Hinduism, you see, for most Hindus, the Vedas are not important, they never read them. What is important is the Itihasas. So they know through and through the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And so, you know, I see very many Hindus, you know, on social media say, no, you see, the only solution now is violence. Time for talk is, is over. Well, you see, you haven't, you have never really tried to talk, you know, you have never really tried to use nonviolent means. You see, here I appeal to your own Itihasa. Krishna, before he goes to war, first tries every other means, tries to avoid the war. And it's only when that has failed that then he resolves to go to war. And so I see, well, not very much of that on the Hindu side. 
you see there is a total passivity on the government side, but you see among the people who ought to provoke the government to, to rethink these issues, well, there is not really any developed uh, alternative. No, instead they immediately go to the other extreme, violence. And so, you know, what the Yati Nara Singh Hananda said, you know, about we have to shoot the Muslims, I mean, it's not only bad publicity, which immediately will be used massively by your enemies against you, which is indeed what has happened with that one little sentence. But it's just a bad idea. I mean, if you're a somewhat more than, than, than primitive Hindu, you have to have thought farther than that. You see, it's not just killing the enemy that will solve the problem. And um, so, you see, think of first all the other possibilities, like I mentioned a few in the Nupur Sharma case, you could have just faced the facts. You should have just faced the fact that, yes, you see, for Muslims this is unpleasant, but it's the Muslims themselves who say it. Okay, what do we do with this? You see, what do you think of the fact that your prophet married a six-year-old girl? Is this okay? You know, in Iran, for instance, in the law, it is okay to marry a girl from nine years of age. Ayatollah Khomeini did it with a girl of 10, okay. And so, you know, you, you could have helped a sort of churning among Muslims. And so rather than this confrontational situation that you have today, where a more martial prime minister would have confronted the Muslims, where this present prime minister thought of no other solution than to crawl in the dust before the enemy. Okay, but you see that confrontation need not have happened, not, not with crawling as a result, nor with fighting as a result. You see, that whole occasion for confrontation could have been avoided. And uh, I mean, that's diplomacy. Diplomacy does not mean just give in. No, diplomacy means to achieve your aims all while keeping the peace and so on. So that's what could have been done. That's what a mature government, conscious of what it is here for, would have done. So that is the policy I advocate. And, and so I, I really deplore the ease with which many Hindus immediately think of the violent alternatives. You see, the, the army and so on are, are important, are very useful, the moment that there is no other solution anymore. But first, we have to explore the alternative possibility. And so, you see, here in the present situation, you know, war is just not called for at the moment. I mean, occasionally, of course, there are invasions by Pakistan and so on, then war is called for. And there I am, of course, happy that India has taken enough care of its military strength to win all those wars. Nevertheless, you can avoid them. So in the case now with the, the Arab states and so on, there is just no case for war. There is only a case for talking and using the opportunity uh, of meeting to get a churning going in the Muslim mind. You know, that's what you can do now. Of course, this solution, this, this present situation is not going to give the solution to everything, but this is one little step in the right direction you can take. That has not been taken at all by these people. On the contrary, they've made a big step in the other direction of, of total surrender and of blindness to the problems with the list. I just wanted to say that Nupur Sharma would not be in so much of trouble had the Muslims followed the same policy back then, not allowed Aisha to read and write. It's because Aisha Bibi wrote so much about her experiences that <laughs> we know that. They should have kept her illiterate. <laughs> Uh, okay. It's not, it's dangerous to have a woman who reads and writes, especially in the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I still share Dr. L's skepticism. And uh, first of all, I want to point out that in the 2019 manifesto of the BJP, 
the idea of equalizing uh, everything under article 30 had been removed whereas mm -hmm. it had appeared in earlier editions this is something that uh, hindu electorate needs to know mm -hmm. secondly another uh, problem that seems to be with this current government is that unlike the congress of the 1950s where you had a clear uh, hindu pressure group in the form of rajendra prasad k munshi and so on there is no equivalent of that in the bjp now there may be individuals mm. I mean, there may be uh, Yogi Adityanath here and there, but uh, there is no organized pressure group as it was, and that had to be expelled by Nehru in stages. Mm -hmm. So what are your opinions on that? Well, in the 1990s, when I wrote my, um, my PhD dissertation about the political Hindu movement, I knew all those people. I mean, many of them I knew personally, and with quite a few, I had very cordial relations. And so I knew the, 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 the way the party was working. Whereas today, of course, this is a new generation and uh, I hardly know any of them. So I can't tell you the names of anyone who, who would really be, um, be a source of hope. I mean, everything, everyone I hear now is either very militantly secularist or is not, uh, has no specific line on this. I do not know of anyone who um, really represents the pro-Hindu line. And even, even if there was one, I wouldn't even be sure if he meant what he said. Maybe he had some other motives. Like, for example, in 2004, the Vajpayee government had nothing to show in terms of pro-Hindu policies, except one which failed, which was the rewriting of the textbooks by Murli Manoha Joshi. But you see, the... Um, one of the party leaders, Pramod Mahajan, at the time reminded Vajpayee that coming in the coming elections, he would have to show something pro-Hindu to keep the Hindu electorate happy. And so he suggested, okay, let's create a pro-Hindu issue. Either the allies on whom they were dependent at the time, the party itself did not have a majority, Either they will take a different line, oppose the BJP line, then you can let the government fall, like shortly before election time. Um, and so you create a conflict where you are the pro-Hindu side. You see, that will certainly throw a pause. Or they come to your side, then you have a majority, then you, you change some laws or take some decisions that are pro-Hindu, and they too are going to attract votes. But Vajpayee you didn't do any of that, and you know the result. So whether that means that Pramod Mahajan was then the, uh, the knight in shining armor for the Hindu cause, I don't know. Maybe this was just an electoral calculation. This is how we tap the Hindu vote, you know, just like unveiling statues of Chankaracharya. Maybe that's all it meant for him. I don't know. And so with the present generation too, I'm not very sure what pro-Hindu stance would, would mean, but at least maybe it would lead to pro-Hindu policies. And that, after all, is most important. Here again, the ideas are more important than the person. Even if a person, you know, does it with all kinds of tainted motives, still, if the result is there, you know, that at least we can applaud. So it is just that, in general, I do meet a lot of people in the RSS BJP that have their hearts in the right places. But you see, they are working as doctors and whatever. You know, they are not in the party hierarchy. And so maybe I can remind you of something that Sitaram Goel had said in a 
yeah, in a very candid moment, in the RSS BJP, the higher you go, and now I'm quoting, the higher you go, the bigger the duffer you is. And so I don't know what it is on the way to the top, but somehow there is a selection taking place or there is a transformation taking place. But by the time they reach the top, they don't have that Hindu motivation anymore at all. I mean, look at the, the notorious statements that Mohan Bhagwat has recently made about Hinduism not being complete without Islam and stuff like that. So, you see, that is a problem that you have for a Hindu line in the BJP, that that Hindu line may be very much present among the rank and file, but by the time they reach the top, I don't see anything of it. And you see, this is a problem I notice, and I can't say I have the solution for it. You know, it's a hurdle that, that has to be taken, and here I invite everyone to set their minds to it. I'm sure that Hindus, although the inside of Hindu society, who know the minds of these Hindu activists, probably have more constructive ideas about this. So, uh, Dr. Elf, I just wanted to say I fully agree with what you were bringing to our attention about the difference between BJP and Hindu rights that we need to pay attention to. My points were only for future viewers that if the real answer lies in understanding and practicing Hinduism and evaluating any person or situation instead of just blindly worshipping them. And I hope that they wouldn't lose sight of that and instead think that, oh, Hindu tendencies, Hinduism is a problem. Leave that aside and act on Hindu interests. I just wanted to highlight that Hinduism has the answers for do, taking all those actions in our, um, in our right, you know, for our rights. Okay, uh, yes. So when I notice a problem here, I had to, I, I ought to look in the treasures that Hindu society has developed over the over the millennia and find the answer there. That is probably true. The only I, I haven't arrived yet at that solution, but yes, I'm sure it's there. See, you see, I mean, I, I still have hope. I'm, I'm sure there's a solution, even though it's, you know, darkness all around at the moment. Okay, so uh, Dr. Lairst, uh, as usual, uh you sharing your thought process and all is wonderful as usual and I totally agree with you. I also sometimes wonder that, you know, all this is going on and the way Hindus are operating, sometimes it does not, the, the two do not match. There is a huge gap, so as to say. And then I think, uh, I sometimes wonder if, if Hindus realize that what you call is a constant state of war. Uh, and I think that is what most of the Hindus do not realize. As far as hero worship is concerned, I am totally with you. I mean, our entire cinema entertainment is built around that whole thing. And uh, the tendency is very much there, though I believe in the past, and this is my own personal belief, that in the past it was more about looking at these heroes or leaders as a source of inspiration but at the same time doing something because of it. But nowadays, the second part is gone and it's just people look at them as, oh, they are doing everything and Modi is doing everything and we just can be passive observers or beneficiaries mm -hmm. or whatever comes out of it. And I'm not sure, uh, according to me, that's the problem. And, and that is why I believe like what you are talking about that there's no proper think tank and there's no, or maybe they are there, but they're not effective. They're not known. So in some sense, institutionalization of that Hindu thought process, having an influence on the government, which, you know, keeps reminding the government about uh, the Hindu interests and all. And I think that is what is lacking. Now, I don't know what your views are and I would like to hear your views about that. Well, Basically the same. I mean, I um, I just noticed this huge gap between what a desire is among Hindus and what the government ought to be doing and is not doing. What they will say 
is that uh, you, that is to say us, don't represent very much, you see. There may be some Hindu intellectuals, uh, and there are certainly choice uh, words for that. They uh, like to spend their time thinking everything ought to be different and so on. But uh, the people are with the government that does things for them. And uh, that, that's always in, in politics a, um, a line you hear a lot from the, those who are the establishment that they disparage everyone else because they say, we are doing it. We are the ones doing it. You are all just talkers. And so you see many of the people who don't really follow politics, you know, when, when it comes to it, they, um, they will choose the establishment. I mean, they will choose those to whom, well, they somewhat trust whatever they do. You see, they are the ones in power. And so you see the people who say, oh, we ought to found a new party. Well, yeah, I don't know how, how much success that new party would have. I mean, in all kinds of corners of uh, Hindu society, people are just too busy with other things. And so these civilizational issues, Okay, let's put it in caste terms. You see what the hostile people will say, oh, this is a Brahmin issue. And they're a small minority. And maybe you see that on the face of it, that's in fact what Modi thinks. You see, he totally threw in his lot with the backward castes. And so, uh, you know, the attitude may be there that, okay, Hindus don't need dignity. They don't, they are not interested. You know, they're interested in what you can eat and not these boutique issues. Oh, yeah, that's that's a really choice term that I heard one of them use. The boutique issues like Article 30, you know, like Common Civil Code and so on, nobody cares about those. You know, they don't mind being disadvantaged as Hindus because they do not identify so much as Hindus. They care about you know, backward, backward costs, uh, trying to get more cost benefits and so on. And Hindu, you know, Hindu issues can wait. That's what the present government council that you see, they think that, uh, people who really care about these issues are, are few. And maybe that's true. I mean, you can say, well, it is always a vanguard that takes issues to heart that ultimately have consequences for everyone, but that most people do not immediately see. I mean, that's, that's how all political movements start. And so maybe conscious Hindus right now are in that position of a vanguard. You see, they ought to have an influence at the leadership level but at the commoners level, they will only start to influence if they found a political party and get success with that political party and so on. That is uh, quite possible. And so if the leadership is not serious about the Hindu issue, then they will use that and anything else they can find to make that vanguard um, unimportant, to sideline that. And so if, if the issue is simply to, uh, to, to keep power, then that will do. You see, they are, uh, they are right now time servers. They are spending their time in, in power or rather in office. Um, this is Arun Shauri who once pointed out to me that you know, when I was going off on a rant that the politicians want power. He said, no, 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 they don't want power. They want office. And so what the BJP leadership today has is office if not power. You see, to explain the difference, think of the time when Indira Gandhi had to struggle against another faction within the Congress party to win the leadership. So then she needed allies 
and so she relied on the left card. And the deal that was brokered between them was okay, you people in Congress, you can have the perks of office. You know, you can have the TV appearances and all the jobs attached and, you know, all the corruption. That's office. You can have the office. We will have the power. And so what they wanted was the power in the cultural sector, in the educational sector, you know, redoing the textbooks in a, in a Marxism-friendly manner and so on. That's power. You see, there is a certain asceticism about the communists, like uh, EMS Nambudiri Pat at the time in, in Kerala was a proverbial such figure. You see, he lived very frugally and so on, but he was a communist. And so they had this, uh, this concentration on power, just like a yogi, I mean, uh, an ascetic has a concentration on on his goal of enlightenment, of, of liberation. You know, similarly, the communists had their eye on power. And whereas ordinary people like those you found in Congress had their eyes on office, they just want to, you know, serve their time as best as they can, that is to say, get as much out of it as they can. And otherwise, you see, the world will not have changed by the time they leave office. They will not have done anything to change it, merely to profit from it. Whereas power means that you change the world in accordance with your own vision. And so that the BJP is not doing at all. Well, yeah, I mean, I, here I have to admit that in the field of development, they, they have achieved something. Okay. You know, the famous uh, toilet scheme uh, and so on. I mean, it's not not 100% fulfilled, but it, they certainly made a difference there. So in the field of development, that's okay. And, you know, what their economic policies are, we can discuss whether they're good or bad or so, but certainly they have made their mark. That I want to concede. By contrast, in cultural issues, well, at best, passive, at best. And... Um, so, I mean, again, I, I can only repeat, that's what the situation is. And now the thing to do, which, you know, after years, no Hindu seems to have found a way to, is to get back in power. You don't need to be in office, you know, if you can determine the policies in this field. That is most important. But you did know, I answer your question? You did do uh, some insights into it. Uh, though I was more uh, interested in finding about the ecosystem part, you know, which can put pressure on both BJP and the government about Hindu interests. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. The ecosystem part, well, yeah, I mean, without using the word, that's more or less what I have uh, talked about. But there is, of course, a, a more and more of a Hindu ecosystem thanks to the new media. You know, back in the past, people were isolated. Now you have a, a very important, let's use the word, you know, a very important ecosystem of uh, Hindu opinion formation. You have all these, uh, all these uh, online platforms and YouTube platforms, like the present one. So uh, a lot of churning is going on. And maybe it's normal that first a lot of churning is going on before that can be translated into political action. But the unfortunate situation, you know, and this is, again is, is something typical for uh, preludes to war. You might want the situation to be different, but unfortunately you're being forced by circumstances. So here your time is limited. You see the BJP stay in power is not going to be forever. And it's not that you're going to get a better party after that. You can say now, okay, I don't like the BJP, I want something else, but what else is there? You know, creating something else will take time and effort and so on. And I see nobody doing that. And the other parties, you know, are probably uh, as anti-Hindu as they have always been. They may have changed a little bit at the surface, 
in the sense of being less Hindu. Now, this is something that has happened uh, thanks to the BJP in power. And it's not, as I hear the Bhaktas immediately say, it is thanks to the BJP that there is a more pro-Hindu atmosphere, like in the, in the entertainment industry and so on. It is less militantly anti-Hindu than it used to be. Well, there is a different explanation for that. It's not that the BJP has done anything, but the reputation of the BJP has done something. You see, everybody says, oh, now there is a fanatical Hindu regime. We know that that's not true. And parties, you see, the intelligent ones among the other side also know that that's not true. But very many do think it's true. And so they, they try to make some pro-Hindu noises, like uh, Rahul Gandhi, you know, the, the Jane wearing Brahmi. So, um, so that, that, that does, these are things that happen. So once in a while you do get a um, superficial but nevertheless noticeable change in a pro-Hindu direction. You know, like, like film stars who have come out as, as explicitly pro-Hindu and so on, that didn't do that in the past. So, yeah, that this might happen. I don't think it's a merit of the BJP. It's a merit, perhaps, of the founders of the Jiang Sang long ago, who told the world that now there is a party for Hindu interests. And so that that annunciation has remained, even though that party itself has lost its Hindu motives. And so that, that aura is still there, that reputation is still there, and that has a certain effect. So that, that helps in, you know, the ecosystem getting outside its borders, you know, overflowing a little bit in society at large, and therefore also in the Congress party that has always been a party that tried to be everything unto everyone. But so the, um, the decisive jump to the sphere of political power has not happened. And that may be fatal for, uh, for quite some decades to come because the BJP is inevitably going to fall from power. And then you're stuck with the rest. The anti-Hindu determination among uh, Muslims, among Christians, has not shown any sign of abating. And so the Hindu position is weakening and weakening. I mean, there are more and more parts of India that become dangerous for Hindus. And so that's, that's the physical dimension of a larger problem of the, the Hindu cultural presence uh, disappearing. So that, that, that I think is a, is a the problem that this ecosystem is ever more conscious of. Something is being done at an, let's say, amateur level, like this uh, Indic Academy uh, does a lot in reviving Hindu culture. But again, you see, at the level of political power, no step is being made. You can have all the ecosystem you want. The problem is there. I mean, I'm basically here to just notice the problem, to make you realize how serious the problem is and a solution i mean i think ultimately you all are better placed to find one than me sitting here far away anyway i mean no matter who it comes from it is urgent you need it at least if within your own lifetime you want to see a real change in tendency from from downwards for Hinduism to upwards. Uh, this is going back to the issue of hero worship. I just wanted to point out that uh, most ancient cultures seem to have some form of apotheosis. And uh, uh, Buddha and Jesus, most ancient cultures seem to have yes. some form of apotheosis. <clears throat> and I think Buddha and Jesus are two good examples of that. So the only difference probably is that in uh, among Hindus, you know, it's a sort of a continuing process. And uh, yes. for whatever reasons, it has taken far firmer roots in Hinduism than 
in other cultures because if you read Roman histories, that apotheosis does not appear in them. They are still mm -hmm. treated as humans. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, do sure. you have any thoughts on that in terms of comparative culture and religion? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, the um, let's say the elite among Buddhists do treat the Buddha as just a human being who did something that every other human being in principle can also do. But yes, you see, mostly uh, he's divinized. Jesus, of course, is very explicitly divinized, but he's supposed to be the only one. Nobody can come up and say, I am a second Jesus. Or sometimes there are people who do, but they're treated as, uh, they're certainly not theologically accepted, and they're often treated as mental cases. Uh, so, no, you see, it's indeed in Hinduism that this is a, uh, an ongoing process. That is, that is entirely true. And um, so, yeah, this may have to do with a specific uh, mentality in this part of the world. Uh, that, I, that, that, that calls for further study. Why is hero worship so strong here? Because I, I mean, you can say, yeah, there is Rama and Krishna and so on, but they are simply earlier expressions of that same tendency. So where did that tendency come from? Yeah. I am with you in uh, looking for an answer to that.